my hockey pitch voice is <laughs> still operational. Thank you very much for the invitation to be here today. I'm not 100% sure why I'm here in terms of, you know, it's not a party political platform per se, but on the other hand, I think that the, the Charter is an extremely important step forward because it is something which is proactive. And this was being said to me that, you know, this feeling that you're being inundated sort of almost on an hourly basis with stuff. You're not sure quite where you react, what, what's the best place to hit and so on. And I mean, it's not just education, I think, where many of us are feeling that. So the fact that you've got something very proactive as the base, this is what we want as opposed to this is what we don't want, I think is extremely important and really binds people together. As was said, in, before I was elected to the European Parliament, I was a teacher at secondary level, um, with a great admiration for those at the primary, because, you know, at least at secondary, you can maybe say things a bit more directly than you, you might be able to do with a sort of seven-year-old. But I remember that feeling of every education and all of the talk about sort of evidence-based policy or anything else didn't seem to apply to education. And, you know, I was around in the time of Baker days. Um, you know, for, I'm sure those aren't going to be included in the new history sort of curriculum. But, you know, this feeling of, sort of um, you know, for God's sake, just let us go, get on and work with the people that we have in our classroom. And to stop this feeling all the time that you were being asked to fill in forms purely for the sake of showing that you were doing something, that nobody ever really looked at those in terms of an assessment about what it meant for the children that you were at interacting with. And also, I think, this feeling that everything that was being done on an expectation of, by this stage, they will be doing this, and if they're not doing this, there was a failure, and the failure, chances are, was yours, and if it wasn't yours, it was your head of departments. And if it wasn't head of departments, it was the head teachers. Um, you know, never government, never that you were being asked to do something unrealistic. And this total lack of recognition that you were actually working with human beings that have a different interaction and that one year can be very, very different from another. And you're not sure what. Was it something in the water? You know, was it a visitation of aliens or whatever? But I remember some years, you just looked and thought, you know, why is this, why is this class like this? You know, when last year's were wonderful and, you know, we could do all sorts of exciting things and this year I feel I'm doing crowd control, uh, which, you know, may well have been a big chunk of my fault, but damn well wasn't all of it. Um, so, you know, this feeling of, of these changes are now going backwards again, and certainly, so a word about the exam system at the secondary level, that again, those of us that have been around for some time may well remember why the exam system was changed. And I hope, I doubt it, but I hope that Mr. Gove has done his gender impact assessment on changes in the examination system. Because I seem to remember that we moved from end of year live or die examinations because boys did better at that, girls were failing under that system, and therefore a different system came in which was hopefully going to do something about gender equality. So, you know, let's hope he's gone back and looked again at the history. Um, so, we've also seen, I'll say something about something that's just been happening at the European level, which is not education per se, but is intimately connected to it. The Commission has just brought forward a recommendation, which is a very sort of weak bit of policy, but on children, and particularly on looking at breaking the sort of cycles of deprivation. And there are two of the big strong elements within that are issues about tackling poverty. A lot of us think they're doing very well at creating it at the moment, but tackling poverty. Because it's clear again from the evidence, the OECD, a lot of other stuff that we know, that there is this issue about the social deprivation in the early years tends to then sort of follow somebody through their whole educational experience and indeed their life. So I think when we're looking at government proposals at primary education, one of the questions that needs to be asked are, are these proposals actually going to open up equality? Are they going to open up a way of moving people forward, or are they going to actually entrench the inequalities that are already there? 
And another element of the recommendation is its concentration on the delivery of quality public services as being absolutely essential in being operationally part of um, dealing with those inequalities and entrenched inequalities. And I think this is, you know, again, something which is extremely important when we're looking at education of change. And it raises questions about, well, who's the education for? What's it for? Um, even in terms of the national curriculum, which schools does it apply to? And why is it that some schools don't really have to follow a national curriculum and are allowed to be sort of experimental child working with children, you know, sort of working with the interest of children in preschools or whatever else. And, you know, are we really looking at a residual national curriculum for those that can't get out and go somewhere else? The concentration about what's this doing in terms of international competition. You, you know, okay, I'm not saying it's not important in terms of people having opportunities in life and opportunities in work, but, you know, Really, surely what we're about is the fulfilment of the capabilities and the possibilities of every child that we have in our classrooms, in our society. And then if you know, people are making an argument, as I'm sure Go does, about facts and this sort of common knowledge as being a factor of integration, social sort of solidarity, I don't think you use the word solidarity, so <laughs> social something else, um, then, you know, if we're looking at it, integration, we always talk about integration as a two-way street. So whose facts are we looking at? Whose communities are we representing in this common knowledge? And is it only that of a privileged group, or is it something which actually draws on the experience of a wide range of communities and backgrounds and people that we have in our societies now? So I mentioned this expectation of things happening by age. And therefore, you know, this whole problem that we've had with SATs, the per permanent sort of examination, you know, which seems to become more and more judgmental every day of the week. And can we please get rid of that? You know, let's look at assessment. Let's look at, okay, how we help people move forward. But please, not this idea that, you know, you're a total failure if you haven't managed to sort of tick these boxes or whatever else. The idea that somehow is at a particular point in your life, because we all know that people develop differently. And I also wanted to say a word from the Charter on the, the issue about learning and the importance of play, which is not, as we all know, quite the same thing as totally messing about, which is an interesting thing about power structures and power relationships. But, you know, that, that idea that somehow on this, but this sort of thing, you know, it's important and this is how. If you are actually physically doing something, if you are interacting with other people as a group, if you are learning about relationships, if you are learning about an understanding of concepts and you know, how things work, why do things work like this, through doing, you know, this is really important. And I think it's also an important thing in terms of an equality of experience too, on which you can then build. It is not a waste of time. It is not sort of about children not moving forward and learning. It's a different way of learning which is extremely valuable and it applies throughout your life. And if you look at the people who make vast amounts of money in terms of sort of team building with adults, most of that is not actually sitting very quietly in rows being expected to answer questions at the end of it. A lot of it is about doing. You know, whether that's abseiling or whether you're on a zip wire getting stuck in the middle of the park in front of the TV cameras or whatever. This, you know, Londoners will remember Boris Johnson on this. But this sort of thing, you know, it's important and this experiential side of education is absolutely crucial, I think. And I don't see it being there in Michael Goh's plans at all, which look as if we're going back to this idea of you learn by rote, you're tested on what you've learnt, um, that the space for real creativity, for understanding how we work together as human beings and how we actually create local communities based on that common understanding, seems to me to be nowhere in his vision, which looks, you know, from my point of view, really, really bleak. And no child in their right mind would actually want to sit in the classroom going through what he wants them to go through. Thank you.